Hello, this is Colleen Shoemaker with the League of Women Voters of Portland, and you are watching the Video Voters Guide. We, in conjunction with Metro East Community Media, are here to talk with candidates running in the May 2020 primary election. With me today is Paige Kreisman, running for State Representative, District 42. Welcome, Paige. Hi, Colleen. Thanks so much for having me. Can you please tell us a little about yourself and why you are running for this office? Absolutely, thanks so much. My name is Paige Kreisman. I'm running for Oregon House District 42 in the May 19th primary. I currently serve as a board member for Portland Tenants United and the electoral and legislative chair for the Portland Democratic Socialists of America, which basically means I run our lobbying department, but we don't have any money, so we're not very good lobbyists, but we try. And in that effort, I was down in Salem last legislative session pretty much every day. And I became progressively more and more disappointed with our Democrat supermajority that working class people in Oregon fought so hard to elect, uh, coming up time and time again with compromises and half measures and sellouts to uh, corporations and the 1%. And that started with Senate Bill 608, the rent stabilization bill, which capped rents at 7% um, plus CPI, which is 10.3% for this year. I don't know anyone who can afford a 10% increase in rent. I know I can't. It was a good bill. I supported it, but it didn't go far enough to protect renters. Then the Student Success Act, which was historic and amazing, and I'm so glad we finally passed that. Um, but it was only half of the funding needed to meet the quality education model standards. So we're going to have to go back again and fight for more funding. And then ultimately, the biggest betrayal was when our Democrat supermajority voted to cut public employee pensions in 2019. I don't think it's acceptable for Democrats in a state where Democrats have a supermajority in both legislative chambers and a Democrat governor to be cutting the pensions of teachers, nurses, firefighters, some of the most valuable civil servants in our state. And that's when I decided to run. And I'm incredibly proud of the campaign and the movement we have built. We've knocked over 25,000 doors before we suspended our canvassing operations due to COVID-19, of course. Um, we've been endorsed by the uh, by a broad slate of unions, by the Oregon Education Association, by Oregon AFSCME, by the Portland Association of Teachers, Oregon School Employees Association, Communication Workers of America, Local 7901, as well as grassroots progressive orgs like the Portland Democratic Socialists of America, Sunrise Movement, Our Revolution Portland. And this is what our campaign's about because we're 100% people powered. We don't take any corporate money. Uh, my only constituent is the working class people of the state, and that's the movement that we're building, is centering working class people and the people most impacted by the policy that is decided down in Salem. Thank you. What challenges have been and will be created by the pandemic to the effective and efficient administration of Oregon state government? And how do you propose to meet those challenges? Well, it's absolutely going to um, have tremendous amounts of challenges. and. Uh, we have a, uh, hopefully, a session coming up that Kate Brown will call to address this crisis. Um, and I'd really like to see solutions that center working class people who are most impacted here in Oregon. Oregonians who have lost their jobs, thousands of Oregonians have lost their jobs, and consequently, their health care. And that's, that's not, a, this is not a good time to be losing your health care when it's tied to employment in this country. So this is a crisis that requires immediate, bold action by our state and actions that center working class people, like a rent freeze, like a mortgage freeze. Um, that way, the working class people aren't put on the streets during a pandemic where the, the risk for houseless people is so much, so much higher right now. Um, solutions like um, ensuring that uh, every Oregonian has paid sick leave and paid time off. Uh, we do have that in this state, but there are some exemptions and loopholes in there. Um, and also ensuring that um, we have the adequate uh, protections for healthcare workers on the front lines of this crisis, uh, ensuring that healthcare workers and frontline workers too in the commercial sector, like grocery store clerks, get hazardous duty pay and personal protective equipment that they need uh, to serve our communities. Um, and that needs to happen soon. So I, I look forward to the session that Kate Brown is hopefully gonna call very soon. Um, and Kate Brown has been doing a, a pretty good job so far. Um, we pushed her, um, and by we, I mean the, the progressive activist left side of the Democratic Party pushed her a lot in the early stages of this crisis, but I really think she's risen to the occasion. And I hope she follows that up with strong protections for working class Oregonians soon. Traditionally, the legislature has conducted the decennial redistricting process, which will occur next year. 
Are you comfortable with the current redistricting process? And if not, how would you seek to change it? I'm not comfortable with it because the currently current redistricting process is very partisan. Um, we know that um, gerrymandering is um, extremely prevalent all across this country and Oregon is no different. And just because Democrats are in charge and I'm a Democrat uh, doesn't necessarily mean that um, I'm, I'm still not gonna fight for the most transparent and democratic process possible. And 2020 is such an important year for this process as well, um, because the 2020 census um, is happening this year. And that means we're gonna have new redistricting coming up with this, this uh, round of legislators we elect in this election right now. And we're likely gonna get a new congressional seat as well due to population increases in this state. So it's incredibly important that uh, we have a transparent and accountable process. Um, I know that there are a couple of um, citizen petitions that have been filed uh, to set up a uh, citizen um, commission that's uh, bipartisan and uh, uh, non nonpartisan, just uh, citizens on the commission that uh, I fully support that uh, initiative that I know a, a lot of groups have been pushing for, a lot of nonpartisan groups that have been pushing for, um, and I hope that we can uh, win that. What are your thoughts on cap and trade proposals intended to mitigate climate change? Are they a good idea or not, and why? I really appreciate all the work that the um, that the climate activist movement has put into cap and trade, but I think it's time that we look beyond cap and trade and move on to a more progressive solution because we are simply out of time on the climate crisis, and the climate crisis is much, much bigger than the current crisis that we're in right now with this pandemic. And we've seen in this pandemic that capitalism is not adequate to respond to big, large scale systemic crises uh, as in its current state that we have right now with our current institutions. So I think we need big, bold systemic change to address the climate crisis and cap and trade um, simply isn't sufficient. Um, so I think we can do a lot better. Um, I don't strictly oppose cap and trade wholesale, um, but at least in its current form, as the bill keeps getting watered down and watered down, I think we can do a whole lot better. And that means an Oregon Green New Deal. Now the Oregon Green New Deal that I support is a real policy package that already exists. It's written and championed by the Oregon Just Transition Alliance, which is a coalition of climate advocacy groups and frontline community groups, such as PICUN and OPAL and Center for Sustainable Economy and APANO, 350PDX. Uh, Sunrise Movement, and the Oregon Green New Deal not only meets our climate goals, but does so while centering justice and equity for workers in frontline communities. Mm -hmm. So it includes a moratorium on new fossil fuel infrastructure, because we can't be building new fossil fuel infrastructure in 2020. Expanding freeways and building pipelines in 2020 is climate change denial. We do not have time to be building decades-long infrastructure projects meant to sustain an economy built on fossil fuels. So a moratorium on fossil fuel infrastructure, it includes uh, funding and investments in frontline communities already experiencing the impacts of the climate crisis, investments in public transportation uh, that's green and clean and fairless um, because uh, we've seen the effects on marginalized communities that fair enforcement um, has had here in Portland in a really negative way that doesn't necessarily even pay for itself. Uh, and the Oregon Green New Deal is about centering the people most affected, not corporations, because market-based solutions like cap and trade, um, while I appreciate the intent of them, and I, I, I definitely uh, don't think that my future colleagues have uh, any ill intentions uh, with that proposal, uh, cap and trade tries to balance market interest and uh, sustaining this capitalist system uh, with the climate crisis, and that's simply incompatible. Um, we cannot Okay. We cannot both address the climate crisis and maintain the capitalist status quo. And that's why we need a new vision, the Oregon Thank Green New Deal. Thank you very much, Paige. And that's all we have time for today. So this has been the Video Voters Guide. Thank you for watching. The primary election is Tuesday, May 19th. Be sure to inform yourself about the candidates and the ballot measures and exercise your right to vote.